These core columns were discovered after the collapse. The angled no insurance company was willing to bear the cost. An urban renewal project of unfathomable proportions. Given the tower's issues and problems, September 11th proved an unexpected bonanza. The Trade Center was built in the 1960s to revive a rundown area of New York, and 40 years later, urban renewal could again take place. Two white elephants were removed, and a brand new complex is in the works. The full height of the new Freedom Tower will soar to 1776 feet. The suffocating dust that engulfed Manhattan was much more than dust. It was pulverized concrete, glass, metals, containing lead, mercury, dioxins, benzene, and of course asbestos. None of that was healthy for any living thing. Today, thousands of rescue workers have developed lung cancer and serious permanent health conditions. And the rescue dogs continue to die. What you had was a ground-level municipal incinerator that smoldered for months, burning up the most heavily computerized building in the world. Patients have had black paste coming out of their pores. They have reported bowel movements that are blue or green and have smelled like smoke, despite the fact that they have not been at a fire scene for months. Only three days after September 11th, Washington instructed the EPA to declare Manhattan safe and reopen Wall Street, though the air remained toxic. A federal judge is blasting the former head of the Environmental Protection Agency for telling New Yorkers it was safe to return to their homes and offices near Ground Zero soon after the 9-11 attacks. The judge called Christine Todd Whitman's actions, quote, conscious shocking, and refused to grant her... Immunity. It was documented that the White House ordered EPA to tell these lies, to downplay the seriousness of the environmental hazards. In addition, 9-11 first responders who have fallen ill and applied for aid have been denied. Asbestos plays a part in the myth of why the Twin Towers fell on September 11th. The steel had been sprayed with a lightweight fireproof foam, which, while cheaper, was much less adhesive. The New York Times has reported that the foam fell off easily and the Port Authority had been fixing and replacing missing sections in the months before September 11th. But even if the fireproofing had been perfectly applied, the impact of the plane crashing into the North Tower was so powerful, it simply blew most of it off, allowing the fire to attack the steel beneath. Once the planes hit, whatever condition it was in uh, before the fact, made no difference because an impact would knock it off and the fire would have devastating effects on the steel. One good smack from a jet plane and the puffs of asbestos are all blown off the steel. Would a few hundred doors slamming do the same thing? Here the History Channel tells us how due to poor fireproofing flames swept through the pockets between floors. As much of the fireproofing had been dislodged on impact, the flames were attacking unprotected steel. When steel is not protected, the strength reduces very fast. When you get to about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you lose about half the strength of the steel. The fire inside the towers may have reached temperatures of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. The New York Times has reported what happened to those steel floor trusses then. The steel did heat up and it became softer and softer, almost like licorice. And eventually, all the steel had been weakened in this zone. Forty years ago, the steel used to build the World Trade Center was certified by Underwriters Laboratories, a global product compliance and public safety guardian. Let's hear a lone voice that spoke out from this enormous company. My name is Kevin Ryan, 
and I'm formerly a manager at Underwriters Laboratories. I was fired from my job five days after sending a letter to a government scientist at the NIST questioning the report that the NIST had recently released in October of 2004. I wrote this letter because I had serious questions about what I saw in the report. Those questions went back to September of 2001 when UL's CEO came to our location in South Bend. He told our entire staff that the World Trade Center steel had been certified by UL and he said that we should be proud of how long the buildings had stood. Over the next two years I did some research and found some very disturbing facts including that the steel had been disposed of in an unprecedented manner. Once I discovered those facts, I sent a written question to UL CEO asking him about these things and what he was doing to protect our reputation as a company. He replied in writing to me that UL did in fact test the steel. He talked about the quality of the sample and how well it had performed in the tests. And he said that our company had tested the steel and that it had done beautifully. After that, he asked me to be patient and wait for the NIST report because UL was working closely with them. I saw this report in October of 2004 and in November I sent my letter to NIST asking for clarification. I felt it was an obligation on my part to ask the questions since no one else seemed to care to. After the 1993 bombing, the fireproofing in both buildings was updated considerably. But when you look at the NIST report, you don't see any testing that showed that a 767 would widely dislodge the fireproofing under any impact, let alone so far from the point of impact. So now we've been left with a new theory that is not really a theory at all, but only a collection of vague statements. The NIST report represents what can really only be called anti-science. They started with their conclusions and worked their way back to some leading hypotheses. When the results of the physical tests showed that the temperatures were far too low to soften steel and that the floors could not have collapsed and that the fireproofing could not have been widely dislodged, the NIST ignored these results and built a black box computer model that no one can argue with and that would spit out the right answers. Today, anyone who's conscious enough to know what's happening in the world knows that most government policy is being driven by this false story. Crack down and punish the perpetrators of this attack. This is being seen on Capitol Hill as another Pearl Harbor. As another Pearl Harbor. As another Pearl Harbor. The steel in dragon-like lengths and contortions spoke for itself. Bent, deformed, without cracks. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. There's no buckling at all. Here is the meteorite, molten iron fused with concrete. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. It is true that heat expands steel. In a fire, steel members may swell and bend slightly. But this, how could these huge tangles have been created? The steel below the towers had melted at many thousands of degrees. Since metal conducts heat, were these twisted remains formed by high temperatures wicking their way through a gridwork of steel? Explosives also deform steel. As they fire, gas pushes outward. The force of the gas can easily bend a large steel column. Two kinds of debris, huge shattered columns that could break a truck, combined with matter that was near pulverized. I haven't seen a door, I haven't seen a phone, I haven't seen a computer, I haven't seen a doorknob. You don't find a desk, you don't find a chair, you don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad and it was about this big. 
1886, 